In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. But darkness was not in any way a sufficient working or living environment. Therefore God said, let there be light, and there was light. He gave form to that which was without form. He appropriately and abundantly filled the void. Literally, he turned the light on. Thus we see the beginning of the revelation of God's divine glory. The beginning, but not the end. God wants us to see him. He wants us to recognize his glory. Ezekiel says of the Lord, His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. As the prophet found out, when God wants your attention, he'll get it. Amen. Yet even from the beginning of creation, God was already looking beyond the physical world to a spiritual and eternal city which has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Amen. Why is there no need for a physical light source in heaven? Because the glory of God is more than sufficient. Thus it has ever been God's plan that man should see his glory. Amen. The prophet Isaiah said to those in his day, Behold, darkness will cover the earth. What? Again? Haven't we been here before? Only this time the prophet was speaking spiritually. Behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you and nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Only the illuminating glory of God could shatter the moral and spiritual darkness which had enveloped the world because of sin. Amen. But even in that time, of spiritual darkness, the glory of God was there. Amen. And where the glory of God is, there is light. Amen. When sin entered into the world, there was darkness. But then God established a covenant line, Genesis 3.15, with the seed of woman. Even then, with the serpent at hand, a ray of light. When God willed that the world should be destroyed by flood, oh, the darkness! Yet eight righteous people demonstrated the glory of God, and the covenant line was still alive and shining. In fact, at every intersection of human history, the glory of God has been there to illuminate the way for that covenant line. The scriptures say the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They don't know over what they stumble. But light is sown like seed for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Many have tried throughout history to reflect the glory of God through such things as art, music, architecture, I know the human spirit and its need for expression, yet such was never God's design nor his will because God's divine glory is exactly that. It is divine. And that which is not divine cannot possibly contain the glory of God. 
therefore, looking forward in Isaiah 42 to one who would accurately represent his divine glory, the Lord says to his servant, the Messiah, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I will hold you by the hand and watch over you, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Amen. Again, we see God is concerned with the illumination of himself and his glory. Now this is not merely about shining the eternal spotlight upon his works. It is about the revelation of his true nature. At the time Isaiah spoke, God had already provided man with his law. Wasn't that enough? The prophet says the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the law great and glorious. We know the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. But we also know it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things. Amen. But there was one. There was one who was to be the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. This is the one of whom Simeon said, My eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. This was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now here's a question. Why would God share his glory with man when he would not share it with graven images? Aren't men also created things? Yes, but... His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them we might become partakers of the divine nature. Well now if the scriptures are correct and I certainly believe they are if we are the offspring of God, then we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Instead, God in his divine wisdom has chosen righteous men as the light of the world which cannot be hidden. This is why we have been told that we are a people for God's own possession that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. This is why we've been told Jesus didn't hide anything from you. From the beginning of his ministry, he told you to let your light shine in such a way so that people could see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now the passage of time has never caused God to forget that covenant line that started back in Genesis 3.15. There has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So now, with this in mind, Perhaps our minds and hearts are better prepared to understand why God deserves the praise of his glory. Praise God that he has allowed us to know him more fully. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. God won't let you miss it. Now, Here's what really impresses me. When you get to that section of text which serves as my message text this morning from Ephesians chapter 1, as if 
an entire universe of evidence is not enough. Picking up in verse 9 of Ephesians 1, we find that God has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Christ with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven, things upon the earth. In Him we've obtained an inheritance... We've been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. The apostle offers us three foundational truths within these six verses for praising the glory of God. And by his glory, I mean that which the Lord has done to illuminate himself and his divine will. First, according to verses 9 and 10, we can offer praise for God's administration. God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he proposed in Christ with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things upon the earth. Oh my goodness. In all wisdom and understanding, God has revealed to us his will once again. He has established a kingdom unlike any other in which his son is king of kings and lord of lords. All things spiritual, all that is necessary for salvation, everything pertaining to life and godliness has been summed up in Christ. Amen. You don't have to look anywhere else. Amen. You don't have to go search the Koran. You don't have to study the wisdom of Confucius. You don't have to read the latest Christian bestseller. In his divine wisdom, God has revealed to us his word, and within that word he has held nothing back which is necessary for life eternal. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, hold the darkness, we've got light. Mm -hmm. Amen. God's grace was given to Paul for a reason. Sharing the good news of the gospel with the Gentiles, reflecting the glory of God. You see, part of Paul's purpose as an apostle was to illuminate his will in the administration of the gospel. God wants us to see his glory. I want you to understand that. He wants us to participate in a divine economy. Amen. Now literally, the word translated administration or dispensation in chapters 1 and 3 is the same exact Greek word translated stewardship in, tr in chapter 3, verse 2. And ultimately, that's really what this is all about. This is about the proper stewardship of God's grace. This is about the manifold wisdom of God being made known through the church. Christians are the ones serving as ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We are the ones who proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, that we may present every man complete in Christ. And in that manner, God is glorified. Amen. Now we have many today who want to be a part of civil administrations. Whatever. We have others who want to be a part of religious organizations. Me. I don't want to be limited to that which is merely physical in nature. 
No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. I want to be a part of a divine administration that's suitable to the fullness of the times. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, now, if I'm going to walk the right path, I need to be able to see what I'm doing. That's right. Lord, in every generation, thy word has been a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have got to make a choice. You think just because the old covenant is gone that we are still not facing a blessing and a curse? It's still there, the blessing if we listen to the commands of the Lord our God and the curse if we will not open our ears to his word or our eyes to his divine glory. Consider the devil. I know, not something we like to do, but let's do it anyway just for a moment. The devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. You know what Jesus said. Be gone, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Good enough for me. Jesus didn't want the glory of the world. Then neither do I. Amen. I hate the assembly of the evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence. I will go about thine altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all thy wonders. O Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. God, thou art my God. I will seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh yearns for thee in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have beheld thee in thy sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise thee. I will bless thee as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul is satisfied with morrow and with fatness. Yes. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Yes. For the Lord God is a sun and shield and he gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Amen. So what's our purpose as Christians? It seems to be in some kind of doubt. They seem to be writing books about purpose all the time. What is our purpose? Our purpose according to the scriptures is to ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Amen. To bring him an offering. What does he want? What does he want? We know what the scriptures say. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. He wants a living and a holy sacrifice. We are to come into his courts and worship the Lord in holy attire. Therefore, may we offer praise for God's administration of his glory, of his gospel. We're just getting started. Look at verses 11 and 12 of our text again. We got, we've got to consider the good works of the Lord and offer praise for God's preparation. In him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Okay, let's think about this. This isn't rocket science. In Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God and counted as members of a divine kingdom. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, which Brother McCulfer went through quite thoroughly. 
This was God's purpose in creation from the very beginning though. He has predestined that we become fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He has made eternal preparation to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Amen. Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Boy, I hear that tossed around a lot. Boy, you sure hear that Lord's Prayer just about quoted at every occasion. Births, funerals, weddings, everything in between. But how many of us truly want to do God's will as it is in heaven? How do you think God's will is done in heaven? Well, Lord, let me think about it for a minute. Well, Lord, let's talk about this. Well, I'm kind of thinking that his will is done immediately Amen. and without dispute. Amen. God's purpose needs to be achieved within us. Again, I would remind you, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. He who prepared us for this very purpose is God, and he has given us his spirit as a pledge of our inheritance. Now, before we go too much farther, farther let's think again on this purpose for which God has prepared us. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And when he finished his physical creation... Didn't God give this command, be fruitful and multiply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that one. Didn't he repeat that spiritually in the New Testament to those who have been spiritually recreated? Did not Jesus say, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples? If you will... Be fruitful and multiply. You will prove to be mine, says Christ, and you will bring glory to my Father. And that's really what our text is about, reflecting the glory of God as we fulfill his purpose in our lives and praising God for the divine glory which he, within which he has illuminated himself in his will. He's shown us exactly what he wants us to do. There's no secret. There's no longer any mystery. We know there are far too many people who enter our congregations to worship with a <clears throat> what has God done for me lately attitude. But now, seriously, there is a proper time and a spiritual frame of mind in which we should consider what God has done for us lately. Consider the scriptures. The Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of those whom he loves. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. He reigns over the nations. He sits on his holy throne. It is a glorious throne on high from the beginning and it is the place of our sanctuary. Amen. Now those scriptures tell me God has been preparing for us for a long time. And from that glorious throne, our king is still reigning. And he has prepared a city for those who are desiring a better country that is a heavenly one. Amen. From that place which has been our sanctuary from the very beginning also comes this heavenly exhortation through the prophet Isaiah. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things which have been done, saying, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish my good pleasure. God has been preparing his purpose from the very beginning. Praise God that that purpose includes us. It has ever been God's intention that we belong to his heavenly economy and participate in the proper administration of that which glorifies him. And nothing, 
Nothing glorifies God more than the salvation of sinful man. The prophet said, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. This then is our final song of tribute as we offer praise for God's salvation in verses 13 and 14 of our text. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations and his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. Verses 13 and 14 of our text effectively summarize this message and the richness of God's plan of salvation. One must listen and respond to the message of truth. James says in humility, we've got to receive the word implanted which is able to save our souls. Brothers and sisters, this is of first importance. This is the gospel of our salvation we're talking about. And having believed, which indicates an active response rather than a passive one, you were sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now I tell you, it'd take a lot more time than I've got to discuss the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but at least verse 14 does a good job of showing us the big picture. The Spirit has been given to us as a pledge of our inheritance. If you have been baptized into Christ, if you have had your hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and your bodies washed with pure water, if you have been made a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, then the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. This spirit is a pledge. It is a promise of our inheritance with a view. In other words, looking forward to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. God wants us to know what great things that he has done on our behalf. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Is that not enough reason? And to recognize and honor the divine glory of God. Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. God wants our hope to be an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. This is the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. He wants us to see how lavishly he has poured forth the unfathomable riches of Christ. It is his will to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. He wants us to understand the power that has been expended to deliver us out of this present evil age. So therefore, we need to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Show us thy loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Amen. I think probably one of the things about scripture that I love the most is how God can say so much in so little. Just as a side note, I happened to see it last night as I was studying. And I tell you, I was kind of confined because my text falls right in between two other sermons from Ephesians 1. So I was kind of wedged right in the middle of the text. But I always try to catch the entirety of the passage so I know what's going on. When I reread Ephesians chapter 1 and got to looking back and forth to my schedule, every 
topic. Every topic that is being preached at this renewal is contained within Ephesians chapter 1. Every one of them. This is the way God's always worked. See, it's not about the constant revelation of new truths. This is about the constant repeating of the same truth over and over again until maybe finally it'll sink through our thick skulls and we'll get it. What has God done for us? Well, I want to go to one of those nice compact passages of Scripture from Psalm 145. Verses 10 through 21, David covers every point that Paul has covered in our text this morning. Starting in verse 10, Psalm 145, All thy works shall give thanks to thee, O Lord, and thy godly ones shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the Son of Men thy mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of thy kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endures throughout all generations. In other words, David's still giving praise to God for his divine administration. Verse 14, the Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to thee. Thou dost give them their food in due time. Thou dost open thy hand and dost satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. And he's been doing this for man since the Garden of Eden. Praise God for his preparation. Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will hear their cry and he will save them. The Lord who keeps all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. David says it. Paul says it. We need to say it. Praise God for his blessed salvation. Now, in all this rambling, you remember where we started? We started with a world that was formless and void and dark. But the same God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is why we can look forward with blessed hope to the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. He is still the light of the world, and he who follows him will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. The praise of his glory. That's what this message was supposed to be about. Have you offered God your heart to the praise of his glory? When you are at home with your family, are you living to the praise of his glory? When you are out in the workplace, do your co-workers hear the praise of his glory? When you meet together as a body of believers, do you sing and worship and listen and participate to the praise of his glory? Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations to give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting, and let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord.